Namo Buddhaya, Namo Ratanataya. So this evening we are commemorating the Parinibbana of Venerable Bhikkhuni Yasodhara, also known as Bada Kachana Terry. And so for us, at least, this is a launching of awareness this year. This is not something we have commemorated in the past, uh, but I am presenting this on behalf of Ayatata Loka, who has been doing just really wonderful research and learning many things which are new to us anyway, and I think maybe new to many of you also. So we're very happy to share that this year. And this is the full moon uposita uh, Paguna Punami. So, remembering the Parinibbana of one of the great Bhikkhuni Arahants is a form of Sangha Nusati, so recollection of the Arahants. And first of all, what is Parinibbana? This is the entering into final Nibbana with the release of the body. And for any of the great disciples, great Arahant disciples of the Buddha, this is a really momentous occasion. And for those who are not yet fully awakened, it may be a time of grief as one of these great beings departs our world. And for those who are strongly Dhamma-minded and for other Arahants, this is a time of celebration of their freedom. So we have texts that describe the Parinibbanas of a number of the Buddha's close disciples, such as Sariputta and Moggallana, and in some places, the anniversaries of these are recognized and remembered during the year. But what about the Buddha's Arahanti Bhikkhuni disciples? So the Pali text canon, the Tipitaka Mula, records the Parinibbana of two of the Buddha's most outstanding Etadaga Savaka Bhikkhuni disciples, that of Mahapajapati Gotami Teri and Yasodhara Badakachana Teri. These accounts are found in the Sutta Pitaka's Kudaka Nikaya in the Teri Apadana. And this is the uh, heroic biographies of the B Buddha's foremost bhikkhuni disciples. And if you're interested to read for yourself, there are freely available English translations of the Teri Apadana. Uh, there's one on Sutta Central, and there's also the website Legends of the Buddhist Saints, which has a version translated by Jonathan Walters. But when were there Parinibbanas? Now, for both Mahapajapati Gotami Teri and Yasodhara Badakachana Teri, in the Pali Canon, the Teri Apadana records the stories of their Parinibbanas, and it implies the timing, but it doesn't state it specifically. About 12 years ago, Ayatata Loka learned from Bhante Sujato, who was starting up Sutta Central, that there is a Chinese parallel to the Teri Apadana that does record the date of Mahapajapati Gotami Teri's Parinibbana. And later, she learned from Bhikkhu Analyo and from Bhikkhuni Damadina that there are additional Chinese and Tibetan parallels which give more detail. So in those texts, Mahapajapati Gotami Teri's Parinibbana is recorded as being a week after the full moon of the lunar month of Maga, which is usually February. And so now Damadarini and others recognize this event each year. And you can see on the right, here's a poster from an event that was held this year at what we think is the location of Mahapajapati's stupa uh, that was led by Landi University, the Retracing Bodhisatta Xuanzang Project, um, India Minister of Culture, and so they have, and other organizations, and so they have um, gotten together to begin commemorating this year at the site of her, of her stupa, commemorating her Parinibbana. But what about Yasodhara Terry? So, First, to talk a little more about who she is. So she appears numerous times in the Pali Canon, and she's known by several different names and epithets. So for example, she was one of the foremost fully awakened Arahat Bhikkhuni disciples of the Buddha. 
She's described in the Anguttara Nikaya's Book of the Ones, in the Etadaga Vaga, where she's known by the name Venerable Bada Kachana Terry. She was a princess, and she was the wife of the Bodhisatta before he went forth and awakened as the Buddha. She's described in the Kudaka Nikaya, in the Terry Apadana, where she's known by the name Yasodara, Bearer of Glory. She was also the mother of Rahula, who was the son she had with the Bodhisatta. And she appears in the Vinaya Pitaka with the epithet Rahula Mata, Rahula's mother. She also had a very long history with the Buddha over a multitude of lifetimes. And she appears in a polytext Jataka, commentaries and manuscripts, where she usually has the name Bimba, meaning golden. So what else do we know about her? She was one of seven co-natals of the Buddha. She was born on the same day. They got married at age 16, and she had their son Rahula when she was 29. Then the Bodhisatta went forth, leaving her behind. So the texts tell us that she was getting news of his practice and his renunciation. And even though she was living in the palace, she was mirroring his practice. She was removing her royal garments and wearing simple kasaya robes. She was removing her royal jewels and no longer using makeup and perfumes. She was abstaining from the use of grand king and queen size beds and seats. And she was fasting and doing other practices of self-mortification. All of this during the six years that the Buddha was doing these practices leading up to his awakening. So after the Buddha's awakening, he returned back to Kapilavatu. And the other ladies of the court went to pay their respects to the Buddha. But Yasodara stayed behind. And the Buddha went to see her. And the stories tell us that she fell at his feet and wept. And the Buddha knew of her loyalty during the time that he had been away. And he recounted a story of one of their past lives together, which at that time she didn't remember, the Chanda Kinara Jataka, in which she had also displayed her complete loyalty to him. And with hearing this story, she realized her stream entry and dried her tears. And she was age 37. At age 40, she ordained as a bhikkhuni, and dedicatedly practicing vipassana, she attained the fruits of arahatship within 15 days. The Buddha named her as one of his foremost disciples. Itadagang bhikkhave mamasavikanang bhikkhuni nang mahabhinyapatanang yadidang badakachana. Monks, this is the foremost of my bhikkhuni disciples in attainment of the higher knowledges, badakachana. So there's a really wonderful video on YouTube of some monastics at Empty Cloud Monastery in New Jersey, uh, chanting the canonical Agasavika Bikuni chant, the foremost Bikunis, which I'm not going to play right now because we're um, short on time, but we'll definitely share the link and I encourage everyone to go listen to it. It's really wonderful. So remembering and honoring Yasoda Rateri. So for so many other foremost disciples of the Buddha, we know the date of the anniversary of their Parinibbana, and we have tangible evidence of their lives in the form of stupas and relics. So does any of this exist for Yasodara Terry? And these are the questions that Ayatata Loka had been asking for 10 years, uh, leading up to just before we entered into winter retreat this year. We don't have records of these in the canonical polytext Yasodara Teri Apadana, but do they exist elsewhere? Now, there are other sources of information. 
there are polytexts and manuscripts additional to the Pali Canon, which record the stories of the Buddha and his teachings, his life, and his disciples. There are parallel canonical texts recorded in other languages, such as the Chinese translation of the Taisho Tripitaka and Tibetan translations in the Kangyur Tibetan canon. And Ayatataloka had for years been keeping an eye out for any Chinese or Tibetan text parallels to the Yasodhara Teriyapadana, which had been so useful with Mahapajapati Gotami, um, but in this case had not found any yet. They might be out there. If you know of it, let us know. There are also old and diverse polytext manuscript traditions of South and Southeast Asia, both canonical and extra canonical, which record smaller and greater variations of these stories and teachings, including compositions of varying lengths, some of which are summaries and some of which are elaborations. And through the centuries, people who were keen on making and sharing merit have invited and sponsored recitations and copying of these texts, of these fragile palm leaf manuscripts, uh, which has preserved and passed down these traditions within these Buddhist communities. So there's a Sri Lankan manuscript tradition. In 2009, Ayatataloka learned of this book, which is by Sri Lankan author and translator, Ranjini Obayasekare, that's Yasodhara, life, the wife of the Bodhisattva. And this book includes a translation of the Sinhalese Pali manuscript of the Yasodhara Apadanaya. And this manuscript is interesting because it's otherwise nearly identical to the canonical Pali text, but it does mention both relics and the establishment of a reliquary stupa of the great Terry Yasodhara. But what do we still not know at this point? So about a month before the beginning of our winter retreat, uh, Deepak Anand of the Retra Retracing Bodhisattva Xuanzang Project wrote to Ayatataloka and asked her about Yasodhara Terry, asking, was the date and the place of Yasodhara Terry's Parinibbana known? And was there also a stupa recorded as there is for Mahapajapati Gotami Terry? So she had to answer, sadly, something like, no, we don't know the date. Old Buddhist manuscripts in Sri Lanka say that there was a Parinibbana relic stupa, but I haven't been able to learn anything about the location either. But then, just before the start of our retreat, Ayatataloka had a feeling that there was more to the story and that the time was right for it to begin to emerge. She remembered reading of a Savaka Nibbana genre of old polytext manuscripts. And she followed up and did some searching, and she found an article of Professor Peter Skilling. And in that article, in a footnote, she found mention of an 18th century Thai painting depicting the Bimba Nibbana, which is at the Walters Museum in Baltimore. However, this painting had been mislabeled by the museum as depicting the Buddha's Parinirvana, though the painting itself contains a clear caption in Thai script which says Bimba Nibbana. In other words, the Parinibbana of Bimba Yasodhara Terry. So after an extensive search through the museum's online exhibit for the mislabeled painting, she saw for the first time a depiction of this great Terry's Parinibbana. And this is the painting we have, you see here on the slide, and that we also have on our altar. And we have a zoom in here on the caption, which reads Vimma Nibbana in Thai script. So with this encouragement and blessing, she put out a quick online request to friends for any more information and rapidly and progressively learned a lot more. So soon, searching in Thai, Khmer, and Lao scripts, she found a treasure trove of information. So there actually exists an extensive, rich, and diverse Bimba Yasodhara Parinibbana manuscript tradition of mainland Southeast Asia. 
there were texts from southern Thailand, from central Thailand, from Lana Thai in Thailand's northwest, from Laos in the northeast, from Cambodia in the east, and from Myanmar in the west. And there are catalog listings and scanned images of some of these that are available online. And one of those is shown on the left of this slide. But it's not necessarily simple or straightforward to read them. So Ayatataloka contacted scholar Trent Walker, who's an assistant professor of Southeast Asian studies and Thai professor of Theravada Buddhism at the University of Michigan. And he was able to provide her with a link to a Romanized Pali critical edition of the Southern and Central Thai manuscript traditions. And that's the book you see here on the right. This was published in 2003 by a team of Thai researchers with support from the Queen Sirindon Anthropology Center uh, research database. And it's a collection of old Pali text manuscripts of Bimba Yasodara Teri Parinibbana, which are pre preserved in old Khmer, Kom, and Mon scripts. And as well as a study, the book included a critical edition in Romanized Pali with Thai translation. So here's the title of the book in the original Thai, and it's Examination and Analytical Study of Pali Language Editions of the Bimba Bikuni Nibbana Scripture by two Thai researchers. So consulting with Trent Walker, they reviewed key portions of this long Pali text and found record of the date of Bimba Yasodara Teri's Parinibbana, the location of Bimba Yasodara Teri's Parinibbana, and mention of the uh, creation of a Chaitya Stupa of Bimba Yasodara Teri's crematory relics. So first, the date of Bimba Yasodara Teri's Parinibbana. And here we have the, a picture of the page from the book with the relevant part highlighted. And this includes the date, Hunami Uposate Pagunamase, meaning the Paguna Punami, in Sanskrit, Faguna Punima, which is the full moon Uposata of the month of Paguna, which is passed down as the 15th day of the fourth lunar month on the Thai calendar. And that is today. So this full moon is already remembered as the anniversary of the Buddha's first return to his hometown of Kapilavatu, as well as also Sudodana Raja's and Mahapajapati Gotami's stream entry days, and Yasodhara Teri's stream entry day, uh, the following day. It is also the lunar anniversary of the revival of Theravada dual ordination in Sri Lanka, which this year will be 26 years ago. And now we will also remember it as the most venerable Arahati Bada Kachana Bimbaya Sodara Teri's Parinibbana Day. And this year, that full moon is today, yesterday and today. So the texts also tell us about the location of Bimba Yasodara Teri's Parinibbana in the uh, northwest of Savati at her Bikuni Arame near the Atiravati River, which is now River Rapti. So here's a map of Savati, and we're going to zoom in on this upper right corner here. And so this is the old course of that river, which is now following a new course. Um, but in this area, you can see there are, the Angulimala stupa is in this area. And we don't know exactly where her stupa was. There are three things here that look like they could be um, mounds which have not been excavated. But we don't know, but the uh, texts say that it should be somewhere in this area. Um, so sorry, the that her that was where her parinibbana occurred, and then the text describe the establishment of a chaitya stupa for the great Arahati's bone relics. So those might be the mounds, unexcavated mounds we see on that previous map. So where are those relics now? 
So we have some information about this uh, in Sri Lanka, according to the Datu Vangsa, together with the Buddha's highly venerated forehead bone relic, there were Arahat relics enshrined in the second century BCE in the Seruvila Mangala Seya Chaitya Stupa in Trincomali in Sri Lanka's eastern province. And among them were relics of two great bhikkhuni arahats, Mahapajapati Gotami and Yasodhara Teri. And for a time, this stupa was inaccessible due to civil war, but it's now accessible again and has been recently restored. So another breakthrough in Ayatataloka's search. In response to her request, uh, friends let her know Friends in Sri Lanka let her know of a recently constructed stupa in Sri Lanka, uh, re-enshrining ancient relics of Yasodhara Teri. And you can see a picture here on the right of those relics prior to their re-enshrinement. This new stupa was built by the uh, Mahamayona monastic community of Sri Lanka, which is led by the venerable Kiribadgoda Nyanananda Tara. And this community takes the highly takes highly respecting the ancient stupas and relics of the Buddha and the Buddha's Arahant disciples very seriously. So here are pictures from the Siri Yasodhara Mahaseya Chaitya Stupa in Udupila. And this stupa was inaugurated with great celebration nine years ago with the formal re-enshrinement of an ancient relic of Rahulamata Yasodhara Teri. And there's a wonderful video online of a slideshow of this um, celebration and pictures of them dropping flower petals from a helicopter, um, which again, I think I'll, I'll wait until the end and we'll show the videos if there's time at the end. So there are also records that there were relics of Prabimba Yasodhara Teri enshrined in Thailand. According to a listing of registered reliqu reliquary chaitiyas in Thailand and the relics they enshrine, there are two chaiti chaitiya stupas in southern Thailand, which enshrine Bimba Teri's relics, uh, which were from ancient Thai stupas, which have been recently either renovated and restored or reconstructed. There's also Wat Doi Damachedi in northern Thailand in Sakon Nakon which enshrines relics of the Buddha and 24 Arahants, which contains relics of Bimba Yasodhara Teri. And here on the right, you can see a picture of that shady and the relics. There's also Wat Santidam, also in Northern Thailand in Chiang Mai, which contains Pra Bimba Teri relics in its famous collection of Pra Arahanta relics. There's also uh, one of two sets shown here of Pra Me Bimba Teri relics in the private Gunarom collection, uh, here pictured in a Thai royally presented commemorative book of that collection. So we've, we've learned a lot and uh, certainly know a lot more about this than we did a few months ago. And it feels like there's probably a lot more to learn and very much interested in whether any of you can help. We've already gotten a lot of help from friends and um, just very curious, does anyone know of any other inspiring artworks which just depict Mimbaya Sodara Teri's Parinibbana? Where in India is the Yasodhara Stupa? Where exactly? Uh, is there a parallel uh, of the story of Yasodhara Teri's Parinibbana told in the Chinese text Tipitaka or the Tibetan text Tipitaka. And you know, as this story has been handed down over the centuries, there are a lot of different variations, which sometimes are quite interesting. And so what, what can we learn from those different variations? And are there any other important resources that we haven't yet uncovered? And you know, as you said, this, this year we are launching awareness for for us and probably many others outside of these places where these traditions were passed down. Uh, so we'll be commemorating this next year here at Damadarini. And you know, what, what would you like to do next year uh, to 
remember and commemorate this great Arahant Bhikkhuni. So thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Would you like to invite questions now? Um, yes, I think um, let me stop sharing. And yes, let's give an opportunity if anyone has questions or comments or thoughts, or you know, it's it's very interesting to to see how um, as we learn stories of more of these ancient Terry Bikunis and learn more about them, how you know it it these stories really strike everyone differently. And you know, some people find one of these Bikuni Terrys very inspiring over another one. And uh, just very interested to know if anyone has any thoughts. Will that question be audible through your device? Hmm, that is a good question. Yes. Venerable Kachayana, do you have any uh, thought or uh, blessing to add to this? So, Sobana is asking, she doesn't have her microphone on, does Venerable Kachayana have any thought to add? Oh. Yeah, I guess I'm just interested in Okay. We're getting echoing. Is that on your end or our end? Um, I'm hearing echoing also. Okay. Not no, echoing okay. now? Okay, it's okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I guess just listening to the presentation and thinking, well, what is under those uh, mounds in that picture? <laughs> Like that's sort of the the mysterious and uh, interesting aspect of it is like, ooh, you know, the the exploration and the discovery and I appreciate that aspect of the presentation that you've just shared. So um, thank you. Great, thank you very much. I don't know if Padipa Da is. Sheila oh, Sheila has a hand up. Yes, Sheila. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Thank you so much for this really inspiring uh, Dhamma message and talk this evening. I am inspired by a 15-day uh, kind of uh, stream entry period. That is extremely inspiring <laughs> to me. And I wondered, wow, uh, what's what might have been involved? And I guess if we're still uncovering history, the details may not be available, but I just find that um, heartwarming and a North Star, <laughs> just beautiful to know. So Thank it was you. actually, she she achieved stream entry just almost immediately after the Buddha returned and told her that Jataka story. And then after her bhikkhuni ordination, she achieved Arahant, uh, fruit of Arahant uh, ship uh, in 15 days. <laughs> Even more spectacular. Right. She had been through many, many lifetimes. She had been a companion uh, to the um, uh, Bodhisattva in his previous lifetimes and had encountered many previous Buddhas and made this Aditana, made this uh, determination, had uh, developed the perfections, had uh, perfected the, the moral qualities and the qualities of. Uh, so that, so that we get to go so quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Aie. Sorry, we're having some audio weirdness when we both talk. I don't know. Padipada is is oh Ananea has a hand up. Ananea. Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> I'm really happy that you're doing uh doing this because I have felt for years since I first read uh <clears throat> the known history of Yashodra, this was, you know, eight years ago or so. Um, and I always felt she got a uh, short shrift. <laughs> the, 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 the Bikuni stories in general get short shrift for sure. I just happened to reread um, the introduction to uh, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, uh, um, Gujara uh, Nikaya. And he has a he has several pages talking about uh, the history of bhikkhunis and and their history within the suttas. Um, 
so anyway, uh, I, I reread that and, and it, you know, it's, it seems clear that uh, um, <clears throat> part of this not knowing and part of the suttas that, that allude to women in very negative terms it seems to be more an historical overlay as opposed to necessarily, I never for a minute have believed that the Buddha would say, would say such things. It made, makes absolutely not one iota of common sense. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, so I, I, I really have, was always inspired, especially because the sources that I read over the years, uh, you know, just as, um, I just opened it just alluded to, uh, you know, they, the, the Buddha and Yashodra had eons worth of lifetimes. I mean, long, long history and a commitment. So when you wonder why, why did, why did, you know, uh, she obtains three entry so, so quickly and the other, the other bhikkhus or whatever, these are long, long, long histories of practice before they, the, they happen to have the, the power means to be born during the, the, the Buddha's, our current Buddha's um, time, time frame. So, um, and I do also find that very inspiring that uh, with that kind of a clarity and commitment that, well, number one, they deserved it. Uh, <laughs> but it's still, it's still inspiring to hear it, right? Yeah. You don't hear the modern day things, but I know the closest one in the modern era that I'm aware of and there may be others, but was Deepama. Now she wasn't officially declared an, uh, an arahanta, but we we don't have a body that does that. In other words, it's not like the Catholics with saints and they go through a process and the Pope says, "Yep, she's really a saint, or he's really a saint." That doesn't exist in uh, uh, in the same fashion in uh, in Buddhism. But um, anyway, um, I am really glad that there's been now being more attention paid to this and. I hope they find the stupa and all those kinds of things. It would just be, it would be a real boost to the bhikkhunis in general and women, women in general as well. So thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ananea. Yeah. Agreed. It's really, I think, good and important for us to hear and spread these stories and learn more about them. Speaking of which, I would like to recognize we have um, Vanessa Sasson on with us this evening, and she's the author of this fairly recent book, Yasodara, a novel about the Buddha's wife, which I, I haven't read this one. I've read another of her books, which I really appreciated. I don't know, Vanessa, if you're interested in saying hello, but just wanted to, um, okay, just wanted to acknowledge that she was on with us and well, we can share a link to her um, book if you, this is a novel, a novelized version, um, but just as another way of spreading the story. And you know, br bringing some aw awareness, and you know, bringing it, the story a bit to life, and um, maybe inspiring us to search out more of these historical details. So we have Padipada here with us, who is now in the room, who's been kind of with us, learning about some of this exploration. I'm wondering if she's interested in saying anything. So I think we I need to give you a microphone. Do you want to come up here? Um, as, as a woman of Indian heritage, mixed heritage, but partly uh, Indian, I would like to say how important this discovery is for young women all around the world and young bhikkhunis all around the world. So far, we have had uh, documented information about arahants who were primarily male. And among the Buddha's family in his gene pool, this is a woman who I compare to the wife of Lord Rama in Hinduism. Sita followed Rama into the forest. 
well, Yashodara couldn't because she had a baby to take care of at home. But she did every single thing that the Buddha did in her practice, showing her utter reliability, dependability, and loyalty to him. I hope that the world who receives this information looks at it within the Indian context where it actually occurred, within the culture within which it occurred. Because to take a Western lens and lay it upon this will create a lot of misunderstanding. And so I encourage anyone who has information to please contact Aya and share with her. She's an amazing researcher. She has, she has contacts around the world of re renowned researchers. And this information is unquestionable. She has checked, rechecked. She has done everything thoroughly to be able to verify every bit of information she has discovered. So I want to say this is a critical, critically important sharing with the world at this point. This is going to be an extremely memorable um, piece of uh, celebration in the Buddhist community for decades to come. This is the mother. This is the wife. This is the importance of the role of someone who was born with the Buddha for generations and generations to finally become his wife, his beloved, and the mother of his child. So please look at this information and receive it within the context of the culture where it occurred. Yeah, thank you so much, Pudi I really appreciate your helping us understand that context. And ab absolutely, as she said, Ayatza Taloka is very careful in her research and also very much open to learning more and anyone who has any more information or um, we're always happy to hear that. All right, I, it's almost eight. Okay. Should we turn it over to you? Uh, testing now to see whether my voice is, is audible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... It would be an aspect of our faith in the uh, Sangha uh, that we have uh, so much gratitude, uh, so much appreciation uh, for uh, those who have uh, practiced and realized who were actual living human beings, uh, not a mythology, not a story, not a fantasy, uh, but actual persons. And so then uh, this uh, historical record, uh, the uh, uh, traditions of ancient India around the uh, veneration of relics, uh, the uh, uh, traditions around the uh, creation of stupas and using stupas as a way of remembering is an aspect of keeping our uh, third uh, leg of the uh, uh, triple gem 
uh, grounded in uh, reality. Uh, anybody who's alive today who is able to hear these words has an opportunity to be the heir of this tradition. We have the opportunity to be uh, connected. Mm. There was a mention of Yasodara's Abhidhamma, which is uh, one of the uh, most uh, well-recognized early texts that we have, uh, uh, words that are very ancient, uh, remembering the uh, respect and appreciation uh, that she is remembered. I would like to suggest now as a bit of a transition that we take a bit of uh, meditation uh, for uh, reflecting on the verses of Yasodara, which I'm going to uh, uh, read to you uh, in like a slow poetry, uh, giving a chance to absorb and reflect on the meaning. So I welcome you to uh, come to a uh, um, you know, receptive, uh, balanced, and upright posture, a respectful posture for receiving these uh, words of Dhamma. At one time, the leader of men was staying in a mountain cave in the city Rajagaha, which was lovely and prosperous. This is what was reasoned out then by the bhikkhuni named Yasodara who was dwelling in that city, inside a lovely vihara there. She thought, Nanda, Rahula, and Bhada, Likewise, the two chief followers, Sodonana Maharaja and Gautami Pajapati, the great terrace of great renown, and the Terries with great powers, they've gone to peaceful nirvana traceless like the flame of a lamp. While the world's Lord is still living, I will travel that peaceful path too. And having reasoned all that out, she foresaw the end of her life.
foreseeing that life's aggregates would soon be destroyed that very day. She set out from her own ashram, carrying her robe and her bow. Honored by 100,000 nuns, the nun named Yasodhara, greatly powerful, greatly wise, then went up to the Sambuddha. having worshipped the Sambuddha at the wheel-marked soles of his feet, sitting off to one side of him, she spoke these words to the teacher. I'm 78 years old now. The last of old age has arrived. I am reporting to the great sage. I've attained Nibbana in a cave. Old age has ripened for me now. Verily, my life's a trifle. Giving all of you up, I will go. My refuge is made in myself. In the final days of old age, death breaks the body into bits. Today, at nighttime, great hero, I shall achieve my nirvana. My defilements are now burnt up. All new existence is destroyed. Like elephants with broken chains, I am living without constraint. Being in the best Buddha's presence was a very good thing for me. The three knowledges are attained. I have done what the Buddha taught.
Uh, dear friends, we're going to change gears now and uh, turn our minds towards the simple, universal, timeless, and uh, effective teachings of the Buddha, uh, the teachings for us about stream entry, uh, which has been the theme that our uh, community has been uh, uh, developing and practicing with uh, during these past um, 10 weeks of the uh, winter retreat time. And uh, we know and appreciate that uh, many of you who have been co are connected to us now with Zoom um, also have been joining on this journey and have the uh, honest and uh, sincere uh, hope and expectation uh, that the words about liberation, the words about enlightenment, the words about the destruction of the defilements are not just um, some kind of uh, something that existed in some ancient culture far away from us, uh, but instead uh, something which uh, here or now is able to be realized that these uh, teachings are given in such a direct and present way uh, with such clarity uh, that we can follow and we can experience the results. Uh, the Buddha strongly emphasized the importance of stream entry. So uh, the vast a uh, majority of the people in the world are considered, um, <clears throat> he's called, I uh, use the word, Uttujana, uh, uh, people who don't have any regard for the Dhamma or for teaching, so for the uh, way to the end of suffering, nor any uh, respect or consideration for the even the possibility. Uh, uh, but then uh, it is uh, uh, possible that a conscientious person uh, can become uh, disappointed uh, with the ordinary things in life and be uh, seeking and searching for something different. And they could be uh, lucky enough uh, to encounter a uh, true person, uh, one who has realized. And they may be uh, lucky enough uh, to hear about uh, the true Dhamma the eye-opening Dhamma. And it could be, if they're a sensitive kind of person, that they've just known all along there was um, uh, something about the way, uh, the ordinary way of understanding the world. Something there is never quite right, never quite satisfactory. Uh, but then uh, hearing this Dhamma, hearing these teachings, it's like, yes, the Dhamma eye opens. We say, yes, this is the truth I was waiting for. I knew it all along. I just didn't have the words or the concepts uh, to be able to see it in that way. So the Dhamma is a different kind of a frame, a different kind of way of, of seeing uh, the things which are completely available for us to experience directly. Uh, the Buddha describes uh, the person who has obtained uh, uh, the stream entry as uh, one who is safe from falling into a woeful state of existence, uh, safe from being reborn into a hell realm or an animal realm. Uh, uh, one who is on a track, in a stream, a practice that will definitely uh, lead them to the ultimate and uh, complete liberation from uh, the dukkha of the round of rebirth. Uh, lead them to the uh, complete uh, realization of uh, true knowledge and wisdom 
and lead them to the complete uh, destruction of the uh, uh, taints of uh, uh, craving and aversion. So even though uh, one who is a stream enterer is not yet perfect, they only have moderate wisdom. They only have a moderate capacity for uh, meditation. Uh, their morality is strong, uh, but they're still able to make mistakes. Uh, but despite still having these uh, human imperfections, uh, despite still having to suffer with desire and aversion to some extent. Um, nevertheless, they've gotten on the train. They're safe. Uh, they're on the road in this dream. Uh, in the Dhammapada, it says, Sole dominion over the earth, going to heaven, lordship over all the worlds. The fruit of stream entry exceeds all of these. Also, it's mentioned on one occasion, uh, the Buddha picked a little bit of dust with the tip of his finger. And he asked the, the monks, uh, which is more, the amount of dust on the tip of his finger or the great uh, mass of the earth? And the monks said, well, the great mass of the earth is uh, far greater. And then uh, the Buddha declared, the amount of suffering that's totally ended in a stream enterer is far greater than the remaining amount of suffering, which is next to nothing. So when we get to stream entry, the fruit of stream entry, the whole great mass, as large as the biggest mountain, as large as the entire earth, has been escaped. And uh, just this little bit, like the amount of dust on our fingers, is the amount of suffering that we have left. Hmm. Uh, during these past few weeks, I have a time for uh, personal uh, seclusion and uh, Uh, I was aware that I had to give a talk about the uh, um, character of the stream winner uh, today. So I, I kind of had that in mind at the beginning. And uh, and yet the uh, reflection that uh, uh, kind of just caught my attention as being uh, where I was drawn to practice uh, was something which is part of the, of the um, four uh, factors leading to stream entry. Uh, the factor that's called uh, Yoniso Manasikara, uh, which is uh, uh, sometimes translated as the wise attention. Uh, so uh, Manasi is referring to the mind. Uh, Manasikara is referring to how we uh, direct our awareness. And then uh, Yoniso is an adverb that has uh, in it uh, the word uh, Yoni, which means the womb. And uh, it's uh, referring to uh, uh, directing awareness in a way that uh, seeks the underlying cause. Uh, that takes any phenomenon, whatever, 
uh, we can experience and uh, look more deeply, look for the, uh, the cause which underlies it. Um, it also is uh, described in some uh, places as being uh, what you could say a proper awareness or a well-directed awareness, uh, meaning awareness which is in line with the Dhamma, in line with this uh, system of teachers. So having heard the eye-opening Dhamma, having heard about Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta, uh, about the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and impersonal uh, character of everything that arises to our experience in samsara, uh, then uh, directing our awareness uh, towards the, the very foundation is directing our awareness towards those qualities, towards those phenomena, uh, framing the things that come to mind uh, in, in the light of those, of those ideas. Uh, so that then uh, we have a chance to experience directly how those uh, realities are manifested in the ordinary things that come up to us. So what we have available for our direct experience is, you know, here's the eye, here's the visible object, here's the experience of seeing that arises from that. Here's the nose. Here's the smell. Here's the contact and the experience that arises from that. Everything that we can experience is just like that. So simple. Uh, but with the eye-opening Dhamma, uh, we've got a, a different way of seeing, a different way of looking, a different way of directing awareness. Mm -hmm. I came to be um, interested in the idea of the uh, uh, yoni or the uh, the womb has another meaning. In English, it's called a matrix. And uh, uh, what a matrix can mean is... Uh, like a geologist or a miner who's uh, uh, looking for uh, fossils or looking for diamonds or jewels. Uh, the earth, which is holding the diamonds, that's called the matrix. So it's the material that's holding uh, the jewel or what we're looking for, what we're interested in. And so it's a different way of seeing uh, normally, the mind is attracted to different objects, and uh, we separate the object from the background, and uh, we just see the object and forget about the background, or we even see some quality of the object, and we don't completely see the full qualities of all the objects, because there's just one mark that's uh, uh, useful to us or interest to us. So if there's a glass of water and, and I'm thirsty, you know, I just see the mark that, well, let me have a drink so I can take care for my thirst uh, without seeing anything to the attention of like where uh, this water came from, where this bottle came from, what all was involved in the possibility of having pure water, which is safe to drink, uh, and what is involved in having this human body, which is made of elements, which requires the balance of the elements and needs to be hydrated. So many other ways to look at it. Uh, so this uh, uh, yoni saw the paying attention to the object, paying attention to the matrix, means that we don't just get uh, like um, enchanted or infatuated with the object. Instead, we see the full picture which includes the object within the matrix. So we see the phenomenon that we experience within the matrix of causation, for example. Um, 
And there's another way of considering what a matrix or what a womb is. And that is the uh, uh, ancient uh, farmers would have uh, uh, one animal that was the breeder, uh, one cow, which has the best cows, it's the strongest with the best qualities. And then they would try to breed calves, especially from that one cow uh, for those good qualities. Or they would save the seed of the best uh, plant if they uh, are harvesting their rice or wheat. And they would take the rice, which is the strongest and the healthiest and has got the best um, grains, the largest grains. And um, save those seeds and let those seeds, those seeds then become the yoni, uh, the basis for the subsequent generation. So in a way, it's like, a, uh, you could say a genetic imprint or a pattern, uh, something like that. And uh, in, in this way, uh, it just, uh, 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 seemed to me that uh, understanding causation looking at everything that happened before in this life and everything that happened in the life before and the life before and the life before uh, going back through uh, countless time uh, uh, looking at the uh, imprint of uh, culture uh, what I learned from mother and father uh, what I I uh, learned from my culture uh, what has come down through civilization, and then in particular, uh, this uh, special civilization of the uh, tradition of the Dhamma, what has been passed down, what was discovered by our Sama Sambuddha 2,600 years ago, and that wisdom tradition that was passed down, that uh, uh, healthy, uh, good, uh, good genetics, uh, a truth, a way of teaching, a way of practice that has the good genes. And then that then uh, has been passed down and it's something to be treasured and it's, it's a matrix of the truth. Mm -hmm. There's one quality of a stream winner that uh, I don't see in the, uh, the suttas that much, uh, but I think it must be a reality, and I I see it in the poetry of Yasodhara and of the, many of the Arnolds, and that is uh, the quality of gratitude and appreciation. So, oh. Uh, We've been in such danger for so long, for so many lifetimes. We've been in this grave danger of this being forever on this this round of of uh, this circle of of uh, uh, pain and uh, uh, endless endless dukkha, endless going around and round. What a miracle it was that there was a Buddha who discovered. Uh, the way out and that the path that he taught was so intelligently designed that it's possible to hear that Dhamma and having heard that Dhamma to understand it having understood it it's possible to practice it having practiced it it's possible to realize it and then having realized it it's possible uh, to also uh, get off this round of suffering uh, get onto the path uh, which leads to uh, complete freedom, complete liberation. And so then the sense of gratitude and appreciation uh, will have to be just constant. How could there even be a minute that, would be, that we would uh, forget uh, to appreciate 
uh, this which has been passed down to us. And then um, a third um, aspect about the uh, matrix um, that occurred to me. Uh, this is um, in the um, uh, English meeting. Uh, if you wanted to grow a, uh, a some kind of a culture in a petri dish, uh, you've got some kind of material in the dish which is uh, nutritious, uh, which supports the life, the growth, and the development of the culture which has been planted there. And the same way, uh, you could say, um, I guess in uh, mathematics, there's some kind of an array of numbers and all the different um, mathematical operations are are planted and able to arise out of that out of that matrix of numbers, or you could say if you had a uh, uh, a classroom with a lot of students uh, who were uh, studying and practicing together, um, that the whole body of the learning and the uh, interaction of the students becomes the uh, matrix, wherein the individual is able to mature in their learning and their, their uh, uh, growth and their skill and in, uh, in their wisdom. And so then uh, when we say Dhamma Nu Dhamma Pati Pati uh, the practice of the Dhamma accorded, in accord with the Dhamma, uh, uh, this is the matrix. Uh, this is the cradle. And so the uh, liberating wisdom is able to grow and to mature are held up in this cradle, uh, this uh, matrix of the complete uh, system of the Buddhist teaching. Among those who are the um, on the stream entry path, uh, there's uh, the uh, four levels of awakening. Um, uh, one who has uh, obtained the fruit of stream entry has uh, completely wiped off the um, uh, fetters of uh, uh, believing that there is a self in um, you know, to be found in any of the five aggregates uh, or the things any any phenomena that one could identify as a self. Um, becoming free from that um, that belief in uh, in finding that self anywhere, uh, uh, being freed from the skeptical doubt and replacing that with that pure faith in that triple gem, and being free from uh, the uh, uh, clinging to uh, uh, rites and rituals. Uh, those are the qualities of one who has obtained stream entry. Um, one who has the stream entry path is practicing uh, for stream entry and has uh, um, a certainty that within this lifetime they will reach the goal. That's the definition of the path. And then uh, beyond that, uh, the uh, once returner, uh, the person who is uh, uh, substantially weakened the uh, fetters of greed and hatred, um, if, they're, if they've obtained the path of once returner, uh, they will be certain to reach the goal within that lifetime. And then when they reach that fruit, it's complete. So for each, uh, the uh, four stages, and then the, the, each one has the level of the uh, the path and the fruit. So once one gains the path, um, according to the Kubodi, uh, uh, we'll make it within the one lifetime. Uh, there's an Abhidhamma tradition that says it's a momentary thing, that you only have the path for one moment, and then you go directly to the fruit. Uh, but I like the idea that um, if I could at least get the stream entry path, then I can be uh, so confident, so assured 
uh, that I'm going to make it in this lifetime. Uh, there's uh, two kinds of people on the stream entry path. And uh, they um, understand that this I is impermanent, decaying, and perishing. It's anicca. It's falling apart. It's uh, anyata bhava. It's becoming something else. And so when you know it's becoming something else, then you know it doesn't have a self because it's becoming something else. Um, uh, likewise, the visible object uh, related to the eye, related to the nose, to the ear, to the touching with the body, uh, to the taste, uh, and to the mind, uh, with any any object or any aspect of the senses, you see that impermanence. And we've been working with this. We know how to do this. And then, uh, likewise, uh, regarding the corresponding objects, any objects that can be seen, they can be heard, they can be smelt, we know that they have these qualities, impermanent, decaying, becoming something else. And likewise, any kind of perception, any kind of intention, any kind of craving, any of the of the material elements and any of the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, uh, volitional formations and consciousness in the sense that these are the aggregates that uh, a person might identify with as being as being themselves, being say, this is me. I am this, this belongs to me. We, we are, uh, so the one kind of, um, a person on the stream entry path it is called a faith follower, the Dhammanasari. They have faith because they heard the eye opening Dhamma and something clicked and they realized uh, that this was the training for them. They made uh, some kind of a decision. This is a, there's an aspect about faith is such a make a decision to trust this teacher and these teachings. And then, even without fully understanding it, the faith follower may pick up this way of looking at everything they experience and they resolve on it. Um, so there are the ones who are the strongest in the, in the uh, faculty of faith. And then the other kind is called a Dhamma follower. Um, and they're uh, the strongest in the uh, faculty of wisdom. And uh, they have uh, heard that same eye opening Dhamma. And they uh, pondered and think about it. And then uh, using their intelligence, their curiosity, uh, their interest in the truth, their devotion to the truth, uh, they penetrate and uh, they come to uh, have a, um, a degree of acceptance of the teachings uh, because of some level of wisdom. Uh, whether one is starting from a faith perspective or starting from that uh, wisdom perspective, they're coming to the same point at the end, and that is the one who uh, can directly know and see these phenomena that are pointed out. So whether you started from a position of faith because of practicing with it, 
in a matter of trust. Eventually, it becomes integrated, internalized. We know and see. When we know and see, that's that's this uh, stream entry. Or whether we're uh, uh, somebody who perhaps um, is uh, not so strong in faith, uh, someone who might have a tendency towards doubt, uh, but someone who's dedicated to the truth and who ponders and uh, goes on their own uh, journey of discovery uh, to try to see, uh, to uh, test and to experiment with these teachings, to say, well, is this really true or not? And by that, their investigation, they find it. And as they investigate and discover for themselves, then uh, well, their faith becomes stronger and their insight becomes stronger. And the two of them will uh, converge at stream entry, uh, at insight. Uh, the qualities that are uh, most often mentioned as the characteristic of the stream winner or the unwavering confidence in the Buddha, being familiar, knowing the qualities of the Buddha, having that confidence, having uh, unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and in the community of the Buddha's noble disciples. Uh, together with a firm degree of moral conduct. Uh, you could say having uh, the kind of morality that's very dear and likable to the noble ones. Um, having the kind of morality where one would never, never, never be able to do that kind of unskillful, unwholesome deed that will take you to a hellish existence or take you to hell or take you to an unwholesome destination. Mm. There's a way in which, um, you know, when we listen to different uh, conversations that people have about stream entry, they make the uh, qualifications seem to be more and more difficult. Um, but there are several suttas which all just point up to the stream enterer as one who fulfills the virtuous behavior of the five precepts. and who cultivates uh, samadhi and panya to a moderate extent. Uh, so in this way, it makes me have a lot of uh, uh, kind of appreciation for like the, the Buddhist culture. If you go to any temple anywhere, on the uh, on the Poya day, uh, when uh, the children come and um, and the adults come, and uh, and they all say, "Iti bisa bhagava abhum samma samputo vinja chamana sampanno sugato lokaridu anuttara purisadam masarji satta devanusana buddha bhagava iti," and they give their um, their uh, veneration to the Buddha, reciting and recalling and remembering the qualities of the Buddha, expressing taking refuge in the Buddha, remembering the qualities of the, of the Dhamma, taking refuge in the Dhamma, remembering the qualities of the Sangha, taking refuge in the Sangha, and then reciting the five precepts and uh, uh, renewing again and again their uh, commitment to the five precepts ever since they were Babies, uh, they've been hearing this uh, uh, within within the Buddhist culture, and uh, these uh, simple practices have become a kind of a template in the person's uh, psychology, a kind of a matrix, uh, so that then 
when we grow up and when for some kind of a reason, our potential for wisdom, our potential to get out of avidya, a delusion, and come into vidya, our true knowledge, that we are ready for that. We already have this uh, template of confidence and morality, uh, uh, which is uh, foundational uh, for uh, finding um, a safe uh, step. You know, we can get on the ladder, we can find a foot foothold. I guess when you're climbing a mountain, they, they, um, you know, people who built the trail going up the mountain, they would have arranged uh, 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 places to put your feet, footholds, and that maybe they would have uh, built into the mountain uh, with the iron bars that arranged the handholds. Uh, so you can always find the next place to put your foot and the next place to hold your hand and the next place to reach and hold your hand. So, so this is uh, what's been built for us, and and so uh, the getting onto that, that first step to be on the right trail, onto the right mountain that goes to the right summit, the one that you want to go to, uh, has been uh, um, uh, planted with, for us with that which is extremely uh, universal. Um, elsewhere, they uh, uh, speak about uh, in the context of uh, uh, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis uh, who have undertaken many more precepts than just the five. And uh, uh, what's mentioned is that a stream winner can still have a minor breach of their precepts as a monk. If it's the kind of a minor precept that's able to be remedied, then a uh, uh, stream winner will quickly take care of that fault, quickly take care of that minor breach, quickly make amends uh, to come out of it. Uh, and so uh, if you want to look within yourself or uh, uh, think, uh, uh, what will I be like when I'm a stream winner? Uh, you will think, if I make a mistake and I do something that's unskillful, am I going to sweep it under the rug and see if I can get away with it? Or am I going to take care of it right then and there, ASAP? Hopefully the same day, without, without fail, I take care of these faults so that we can then uh, uh, not have the, the shadow of uh, uh, unwholesome, unskillful uh, behavior, dragging us backwards, uh, holding us down. Uh, uh, likewise, um, uh, there's a, um, I found in the sutta a reference to um, Uh, uh, dwelling uh, beautiful in this uh, the meditation which is beautiful in this life uh, blissful in this life and uh, uh, that meditation is described as uh, contemplating uh, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and uh, contemplating uh, the goodness of uh, virtue the, the beauty and the, the sense of freedom and virtue. Um, uh, uh, I found a footnote. I'm studying Pali, Pali now, so I, I have some more resources to see what the commentators say. And I, I found a reference to um, Upachara Samadhi, which is uh, uh, the uh, level of uh, a concentration that's just previous to obtaining the first jhana. And even at that level, is uh, good enough to be a stream winner. 
So even if a, a person feels that their meditation is like not that strong, uh, they don't should not feel that it's impossible for them to be a stream winner, to find their foothold, uh, to get on the path, uh, to find their handhold, and to be uh, on the way. Mm. So um, uh, this is my reflection about uh, uh, the qualities of the stream winner. And I hope that uh, this may be something that uh, uh, could be useful or um, encouraging for all of us. I know I've gone all the way up to nine o'clock. Um, I'd like to um, encourage those who are regulars uh, to be ready to uh, continue discussing this on Tuesday which is our next uh, uh, Dhamma program. Uh, I would uh, open up now in case um, anybody uh, has would like to uh, uh, make a comment or to uh, share uh, something uh, uh, about uh, stream entry and their experience with stream entry. Sivajana, would you like to add a comment or save it to Tuesday? I need to come around and speak to the microphone if you want to speak. I just want to appreciate uh, Ayasobana's reflection on stream entry and uh, bringing in the, the path as well as the fruit. And um, I think that um, yeah, my mind is is uh, kind of not grasping on to very much at this this hour, but um, I think that the the joy in one's life this is one thing uh, that increases uh, as we develop on the path and. Um, just the uh, the interest and excitement at um, hearing the Dhamma. I think this is a, that's an expression of that sada, that that faith, and just that that wonder. Like uh, we're reflecting on the um, life of Yashodara. And just the wonder that uh, people had that opportunity and and had that accomplishment and that being so inspiring that so all that all these opportunities for joy and and uplift and um, brightness in our lives it's a uh, we're understanding that, like the causes of dukkha, but there's also the causes for joy, for happiness in the dhamma, and then the so the inspiration of the sangha, which is also that uh, reflection on uh, those such as uh, Yashodara. Uh, this is. Uh, I think these are these are all nutriments for the path. So I, I it's a like maybe this is a little bit disconnected, but this is what kind of a, a reflection and uh, maybe something more developed. I'm not sure who, which one of us is going to speak tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
but um, I really appreciate uh, the sharing tonight. Thank you very much. Let us close by uh, giving our homage to the Triple Gem. Sama Sambuddha Bhagavan Buddham Bhagavan Bhagavati Savakato Bhagavata Jamma 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 Sambi Suparti Pando Bhagavato Savakasanko Samanamon Thank you everyone for your uh, patient listening, for your practice, and for your uh, uh, appreciation of the Dhamma, of the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.